In the spring of 1909, the Consolidation Coal Company took options, pending a survey to purchase 100,000 acres of coal lands in Pike, Letcher, and Knott counties from John C. C. Mayo's Northern Coal and Coke Company. As the survey reports came in, one location stood out from the rest. The report said that the Elkhorn No. 3 coal seam averaged 14 feet thick at the head of the Wrights Fork of Boone Creek on the Kentucky River. Consol immediately entered negotiations with the Lexington and Eastern Railroad to extend its rail line 100 miles up the Kentucky River to a site that would soon be named McRoberts, Kentucky. From the Coal Trade Bulletin, Volume 25, dated June 1, 1911. Headline, Consolidation Coal Company Starts Another Town on Kentucky Property. The Consolidation Coal Company, building the new town of Jenkins on Elkhorn Creek, Kentucky, has started another model town on its property across the mountain from the headwaters of Elkhorn. On the right fork of Boone Creek, at the terminus for the extension of the Lexington and Eastern Railroad under construction. The new town has been christened Mac Roberts, and a post office will shortly be established. Already, telephones, electric lights, hotels, boarding houses, barns, and many conveniences have been built, while there is much building under headway. The Nicola Building Company of Pittsburgh, which has a contract for building the new town, has a large band mill and several sawmills cutting timber from the forest of Wright's Fork. Its contract includes about a thousand houses for Mac Roberts, as well as 1,500 for Jenkins. Another thousand may be built in the Jenkins area. It is intended that the building shall be completed and mining underway by the time the railroads are complete to the new towns. The Sandy Valley and Elkhorn will reach Jenkins while the l &E will cover MacRoberts. Over 500 men will be employed at MacRoberts within a short time. The town Consol would build on the Wrights Fork site would be named MacRoberts in honor of Samuel MacRoberts, a leading American banker and member of the board of directors of the Consolidation Coal Company. Samuel was born in Malta Road, Missouri on December the 20th 1868. He completed his higher education with both a B.A. in 1891 and an M.A. degree in 1894 from Baker University. He also received an L.B. or Bachelor of Letters from the University of Michigan in 1893. Mac Roberts entered the banking business straight out of college, a job for which he was hand-picked by none other than J.P. Morgan. In 1909, he was appointed Vice President of the National City Bank of New York, a job he would officially hold for 10 years. During World War I, he was the Chief of the Division of Procurement for the Ordnance Department of the United States Army. Samuel McRoberts was officially promoted to the rank of Brigadier General on the 26th of August, 1918, and hence was commonly called General Mac Roberts. After the war, he was appointed president of the Metropolitan Trust Company of New York in 1921, and in 1925, he became the chairman of the board of the Chatham Phoenix National Bank of New York until his retirement from the banking industry in 1932. He was also the key figure in the migration of the Canadian Mennonites to Paraguay that happened in 1926 and 27. In a strange coincidence, General McRoberts passed away on September the 9th, 1947, just months after the mining operations were shut down and the last coal was shipped out of the town bearing his name. The Consolidation Coal Company often referred to Mac Roberts as the sister city of Jenkins. This is interesting, as other than the power plant and the lake, 
Mac Roberts was built almost as an exact duplicate of Jenkins. This included a manager's house and an office complex. In Kentucky, Consol built only one other town in this fashion, that being Van Leer, headquarters for Consol's Miller's Creek Grenadier Block Coal Division. After the survey findings reported in 1909, Consol immediately negotiated with the Lexington and Eastern Railroad to extend their line 100 miles from Dumont, near Jackson, Kentucky, to the head of Wright's Fork of Boone Creek on the Kentucky River. Yet, it would be almost a year before Consol became the primary investor in B&O's Sandy Valley and Elkhorn Railroad and began extending it to the headwaters of the Elkhorn Creek to present-day Jenkins. But this was only done after the Eleni Railroad gave an estimate of two to three years before their extension could be completed. Consol was then hit with another setback, as the B&O reported that due to the roughness of the terrain, the extension of the SV&E would take about the same amount of time to extend the track 20 miles to the Jenkins site. It was only then that Consol came up with the Virginia option through the auspices of George Jenkins. When we look at a topography map of the area, we find that almost all of the coal mined in the Jenkins area could have been mined from the Mac Roberts site. Indeed, we find that the opposite occurred. In 1947, Consol shut down the last mine in Mac Roberts. Yet, they would continue to mine the coal from the town for several years through the number 27 operation in Dunham. At the same time, Consol deeded the Mac Roberts office building to the United Mine Workers, which had been the primary tenants of the building for several years, for the sum of one dollar. However, for almost 35 years prior to this, the Mac Roberts office building and manager's house had not been used to their full intent, purpose, and functional capacity. So why were they built? When we read the book, History of the Consolidation Coal Company, 1864 to 1934, by Charles Beachley, we find that Consol had trademarked three brand names for the, quote, quality of the coal, unquote, shipped from Kentucky. The Miller's Creek Division carried the name Grenadier. The Elkhorn Division carried the name Cavalier. The third division was to carry the name Pioneer. But this trademark was never used, and the location of the intended division is never named. As we read from the article in the Coal Trade Bulletin, the Nicola Building Company was contracted to build 1,000 houses in Mac Roberts, and this contract was ultimately fulfilled. However, only 600 houses were built in Mac Roberts. This begs the question, what happened to the other 400 houses? In addition, the Nicola Company was given the green light on the construction of the additional 1,000 houses. But again, where were they built? This means that we have five mysteries and no explanations. In this video, we will explore these mysteries, but the explanations are the subject of our next video. When construction began in the fall of 1910, Consol brought in two road crews. The first expanded and widened the existing road across the mountain from Elmira, Virginia, to Jenkins. The other was put to work building a new road from Dunham across the mountain to Mac Roberts. When these two tasks were finished, these crews were put to work building the streets of Jenkins and Mac Roberts. But before the street construction began, the Mac Roberts crew widened and upgraded the existing road from Mac Roberts to the logging camp of Chip now called Neon, Kentucky. Later, when the rough streets were done, they would also upgrade the roads between Chip and the Elkhorn coal sites 
of Hemphill and Haman, ultimately extending the Haman Road back to Dunham. All of this preliminary road work was done prior to 1913. The Eleni Railroad entered Mac Roberts in November of 1912. At the same time, Eleni began construction of a consolidation rail yard at the logging camp of Chip. Ultimately, this yard would be used to assemble loaded coal cars from Mac Roberts, Fleming, Hemphill, and Haymond as none of these sites had extended rail yards for storage of loaded cars, other than the temple and mining operation in Shays Fork. When we take a close look at all of these occurrences, it becomes clear that Consol had intentions for Mac Roberts that were unachieved, and the question of what, where, and when arise. The area had first been surveyed in the late 1800s, by Richard Brose with the backing of a man named Horace Walbridge from Toledo, Ohio. After Walbridge died, Richard Brose could not convince the railroad to extend into the headwaters of the Elkhorn Creek. Heartbroken and unable to obtain financial backing, Brose turned to John C. C. Mayo and sold all of his holdings for the mere sum of $30,000. Mayo, after confirming Brose's findings with his own survey, turned to Senator Watson of the Consolidation Coal Company. Mayo and Watson then worked out a peculiar deal that all hinged upon the findings of an independent survey done by the Consolidation Coal Company. When that survey report came in, Consol immediately turned to the l &E Railroad Company, whose closest rail line was over a hundred miles away. This is quite peculiar, as the b &O Railroad had a spur that ended 20 miles from present-day Jenkins. So why was Consol more interested in Wright's Fork than the Elkhorn Creek? The answer to that is what the survey report was reporting. Consol had sent in three separate survey teams, and all of them reported that the coal on Wright's Fork ranged from 7 to 19 feet thick, with an average height of 14 feet. This coal got thinner and thinner the closer it got to the Elkhorn Creek, as just across the Elkhorn Creek is the limestone formation known as Pine Mountain. When the l &E Railroad reported that it would be late 1912 to early 1913 before the expansion could be completed, and because construction needed to begin as soon as possible, Consol started looking for an alternative and invested heavily in the Sandy Valley and Elkhorn Railroad. The SV&E had been started by the B&O Railroad in 1902 in an attempt to compete with the C&O Railroad for valuable Kentucky coal and timber along the Elkhorn Creek of the Big Sandy River. However, because of the ruggedness of the terrain, by 1909, only 10 miles of the rail had been completed, and Consol was told that even with their investment, because of the terrain, it would still be well over a year before the line would reach the headwaters of the Elkhorn Creek. By the fall of 1910, a solution had been found. Across the Pine Mountain in Virginia, Consol would pay to have the Interstate Railroad extended to within five miles of what would become Jenkins, their first construction site, and as the construction carries began arriving on the Elkhorn Creek, negotiations with John C. C. Mayo were being finalized. The land would be deeded in a total of 12 deeds, the first six signed in November of 1910 and the final six in February of 1911. Like Jenkins, the Wrights Fork site had been selected as, quote, another model town, unquote. Although the buildings would not be made of brick, Mac Roberts would have all the buildings and services that Jenkins had, save a lake, power plant, and a hospital. 
Mac Roberts would receive her power from the power plant at Jenkins, and at least three water filtration plants would be built as the water source for the town. Two of these would still be standing in the early 1980s. Mac Roberts, like the rest of the coal camps in the county, was unique in that other than a few farms, there were no existing settlements and no workforce. Because of the deal that Consol had made with Bayo, Consol spent millions planning and developing not only the mines, but the towns that would be required to attract and house the workforce as well. They built water systems, a power plant, offices, temples, houses, roads, schools, churches, and other amenities before ever shipping any coal. Because there was no workforce and industry to support this construction, Consol also had to import that workforce and those materials as well. All of this meant that Consol was spending millions and millions more on this particular work site than any other cooperation that they had ever been involved in. In addition, Consol not only contracted with one railroad, which cost money, they ended up contracting with three, which cost even more. The Consolidation Coal Company took all this in stride. They had determined to build at least two model towns, and they paraded them using the press and photos like no other site. They had also copyrighted two trademarks for the two model towns, Cavalier and Pioneer. Ultimately, the Consolidation Coal Company would only use the Cavalier brand. So what became a Pioneer? That's the subject for the next video. Thank you for watching Pioneer Coal, the history of Mac Roberts, Kentucky. We want to thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we bring you the history of the coal camps of the Appalachian Mountains. Please like, subscribe, and share below. Also hit the bell for notifications for when we post future videos. Once again, be sure to leave us a hey y'all in the comments section below. Thank you for continuing to support us and watch our videos. It is your continued support that helps us to develop and bring you new content.